This is Golf Smarter. Sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Elizabeth. Hi, Fred. How are you? I'm good, you yeah. Yeah, you had your shot yesterday, huh? Yeah, yeah, you did. So, <laughs> in, betw- in between rounds, a little sore today. Yes, a little sore. Oh my gosh, I haven't walked 36 holes in so long. Um, it's a different pace to it. Um, it's Well, first of all, it's a really long day. So you have your warm up and each round is roughly four and a half hours plus a little kind of mid break. So um, I was like, wow, I haven't walked 36 since like college golf. But um, yeah, you know, I gave it a run. <laughs> well, let, let's back up and explain why we're talking about you playing 36 holes. I was talking about getting a COVID shot, but that's OK. We can talk oh, about walking 36 yeah. holes. <laughs> yeah, I'm like tired. That's why you're tired today. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. All right. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, J.J. Resnick was on the Golf Smarter podcast, and J.J. was a student uh, and played for Tony Manzoni, who is one of the heroes, the great heroes of the Golf Smarter podcast. He's no longer with us. But J.J. has amazing stories, too, that Tony helped him get a job uh, as a caddy, and he ended up being Gerald Ford's caddy for the rest of Gerald Ford's life, and he had great stories about it. So it was really a lot of fun. And then um, just last week, I'm about to go into an interview with uh, Bobby Aldridge for another episode, and I hear, Fred, Fred, and I look out my window and popping over the fence over here on the 13th fairway of Marin Country Club, uh, JJ's popping his head up going, come here, I want you to meet somebody. I'm like, I'm, I'm, God, I'm going into an interview. Uh, and he brings me out and he introduces me to you. Mm-hmm. Okay, so give me some backstory. What were you guys doing out there, and how did you get together? Yeah, so me and JJ were doing a practice round for the U.S. Women's Open Qualifier, which was just this past Monday over at Marin. That was the 36 holes. Yeah, that was the 36 holes. Okay. Um, and we got talking, and um, because I so I play professional golf over in the Symmetra tour. And I had just done a 11 hour car ride back from Utah. And I was telling him, I was like, oh man, you know, like long drive. Like, so like, I've been trying to find some good, you know, podcasts to listen to. And then, um, and then I was like, oh yeah, like, um, I was listening to this really good golf uh, podcast called golf smarter. And he's like, no way. And then he's like, he's like, literally that guy lives here over on the 13th hole. And it was so funny. Um, But yeah, and then so, oh, yes. And then back to where me and JJ first got connected, I was listening to a different podcast, Entrepreneurs on Fire, and JJ was on that podcast. And Um, yeah, I like listening to like business podcasts and golf podcasts and like everything. And listening to it, his story really really stood out to me because he's a, or like he tried to play professional golf. So it totally just, you know, resonated with me. I was like, oh, wow, like this is cool. So I was like, yeah, like I need to, you know, reach out to him. So I did. Oh my gosh. Um, So I guess you said you were driving back from Utah to the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was clearly a very long drive. 11 hours. Yeah. Uh, and what were you doing in Utah? So I had a Symmetra Tour event out there. Okay. So the Symmetra Tour is like the ladies version of the Corn Ferry Tour. So the tour okay. below the LPGA. So okay. yeah, I was driving back home. And, wow. So I have so many questions about yeah. life on the tour. Um, but we'll get to that in our next segment. I, I want to learn more about you. Um, where did you grow up? Mm-hmm. So I'm from Walnut Creek. Um, here in and the Bay Area. It, yes, here in the Bay Area. I play my college golf here locally as well over at San Jose State. And then mm-hmm. um, I graduated um, in May 2018 and turned pro that summer. And my rookie season on tour was 2019. 
And how did you do on the uh, San Jose State team? It was good. Um, it was cool during uh, my four years of college golf. Um, I was like the third person ever in the school's history, which is like we have like a 42 year program, which is like, I think, 45 years by now. But anyways, I was the third person to play in every single tournament my freshman year through senior year, every single tournament, every single round. So I was a consistent player for us. (laughs) <laughs> that's pretty, that's really impressive because f- yeah. for little I know about college golf, there's not a lot of spaces available uh, to, to play on a team, especially with a storied team like San Jose. You said it's been around for what, 40 years. Oh yeah. It, it's been around a long time. So as a freshman, how did you get a chance to be uh, playing and not a substitute? How did you get on the tour? The not their tour, but how did you get on the team to be? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, basically, so, well, I'll kind of backtrack here. So I kind of had a later start in golf versus most. Um, so my parents don't play actually. So, um, I started when I was 13. Um, it was master Sunday actually. So family friend came over. Um, it was my first time watching golf. Um, I was like, Oh, this is pretty cool. So he brought in his clubs and then, um, showed them to me and then we took them to my backyard and he had me hitting cotton balls actually. <laughs> and I was, <laughs> I was like a natural athlete cause I had done swimming and water polo. So he was like, Oh yeah, like your natural motion looks like pretty like solid actually. So then he picked me up after school uh, that Monday, took me out to the driving range and then I just loved it. Um, instantly yeah, falling in love. Instantly fell in love and picked Same. it up full time. And, um, I'm someone that when I want to do something and like commit to something, I go after it with full like throttle and everything I have. So, um, I mean, even thinking about it probably from literally from my freshman or sophomore year of high school, all the way through senior year, I didn't take a single day. I mean, single like, like day off of practice, like, Every day it was, oh yeah. Even if it was raining, we would go into like the golf galaxy and like putt in there, or we would watch golf channel (laughs) and Dan would pick me up after school and we would do it every day. And I loved it. So that's how, um, me having this late start, that's how I got good so quickly. And I'm curious why you consider 13 a late start. Who are you competing against that makes you feel like you started when you were old? A lot of these girls start really young. I mean, they grow up in in like a golf family and a golf background. A lot of girls start playing at age five, age six, but at least by, I mean, age nine, 10, they're already playing tournaments and, you know, doing like the girls golf or something on Sundays. So 13, I mean, I was in eighth grade. So I feel like nowadays in sports today, everyone gets focused like on one sport quicker and starts younger and gets like really good coaching quicker. It's a lot more competitive nowadays. Yeah. A lot more competitive. Do you see a lot of burnout from these women who start at five and by the time you're here, you are on the Symmetra tour and they're like, uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes, I mean, I think I more so saw it through college golf, sometimes various girls that I knew on like different teams. It was like, cause like you work so hard and you grind so hard and a lot of these girls, their parents push them hard. So by the time that they're in college, it's kind of like, all right, like they're still interested in it, obviously, but it's kind of like, they just want to finish golf and be done. Um, but I would generally say that pretty much anyone who's pursuing like golf after college is going to be into it, right? Because it's your career. It's what you're investing into like yourself, you know, it's time, money, you know, experience. Like, so it's something that I feel that anyone that's out here on the Symmetric Tour really wants to be out there. Um, And the women that you were competing against on the 36 uh, hole tournament that day, were Mm -hmm. those all Symmetric players as well? Because I noticed a lot of college golf bags. Yes. So it was a combo of Symmetra Tour players. I saw some girls that I know out there, some LPGA players. I saw a lot of college golfers were there. Um, Yeah, particularly um, I saw a bunch of the Stanford team was out there. 
Um, I know the um, assistant coach and head coach because I used to work their golf camps in summer. So I just talked to Lauren briefly and they have regionals at Stanford next week. So I think like the timing of it, I think that for a lot of these teams, I think that that's why that there were so many out here. Okay. Okay. Hey, we're going to take a time out right now. Now, let me just explain because if you're a podcast listener right now, you're going to have a commercial break. Uh, but if you're watching, um, if you want to watch uh, this video, this conversation is going to be on YouTube on our Golf Smarter TV channel. And instead of breaking for commercial, we're going to take this first break and we're going to see the uh, 11th hole at Marine Country Club, uh, which is a par three, uphill par three that you played. So I came out and watched you play 11, 12, and 13. And we're going to go ahead and watch number 11 on YouTube right now. But if you're listening, we'll be right back after this. Here's Elizabeth's tee shot now on number 11, par three. Oh, that was a beautiful shot. Um, probably about 10 to 15, 10 to 12 feet from the flag. Uh, going downhill on that. And uh, this is the fourth group that I've seen so far. And that is one of the closest, uh, closest shots to the flag that I've seen yet. Um, some of like the last group, two women, one put it in the bunker and one went long. But this is a tricky green and nobody's made a decent putt yet. So we'll see what happens when Elizabeth, Elizabeth steps up. We're on the green of the 11th hole, par three. We're in Country Club, US Open Women's Qualifier for the 2021 uh, U.S. Open being played in San Francisco. Elizabeth Schultz with uh, J.J. Resnick carrying her bag today. J.J. just reported that she's been struggling on the back nine here. She's having a tougher time on the second round. After the first round, she was two under and tied for second. Of course, it's dried out. It's in the mid 80s right now. It's a downhill putt. It's pretty quick. She recognizes that. Come on, Elizabeth, put this one in. Yes! And she gets the birdie. Good call. So, JJ is a member here at Marine Country Club, so he knows this course really well. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, am I good luck? Yeah, you are. <laughs> with us. Keep going. So, wh how, what's your score right now? So we're... Six bogeys on the, the one to 11. Oh, man. Is that her first birdie? Yeah. On the back? Yeah. On the second round. On the second round, yeah. She, she bogeyed... Um, Two, three, four, six, nine, and ten. Uh, is she beating herself up? No, no, she's pretty well, staying pretty um, even, even keeled. Great. But, um, just, just start to hesitate a bit and question some of the, some of the shots and reads and wind swirling. And yeah. Is she missing, missing putts or missing fairways? Yeah, it's both, but mostly just having like five, six squares from R that are just going right over the edge. Oh, God. So on the video, we just saw hole number 11, par three uphill. Um, I had been standing at that hole now for three or four groups. And your shot um, was the closest to the pin that I had seen which got me very excited, but you were still like a good 15 feet away yeah, downhill. It was about nine. It was about nine feet. Well, from where <laughs> I was standing, 15. But from, okay. <laughs> from the ball to the pin, it was probably nine. But still, it was a downhill <laughs> putt, right? Um, yeah, and you birdied the hole. I did. I did birdie it. Yeah. 
It was a good Yay. putt. That was a double, that was like a double breaker putt on it. Me and JJ were like looking at it for like a hot minute there. We're like, okay, which way is this thing going? But yeah, we got it. So tell me what, what it's like to have JJ on your back. Oh, it was awesome. He was a great caddy. I mean, it was really cool, you know, because also like him and his whole story, I mean, 20 like years ago or whatnot, he used to be a full-time caddy. And like, you could like really see that because he was so good at it. It was like all of our lines that we saw over on the putting green was directly in sync. And then, um, I mean, just like our personalities just meshed super well between holes and walks. We would talk about other things. Um, and then when it's go time though, it would be, Hey, like I'm thinking about this target. We would talk about our club selection factor in the wind. And then it was go time. But yeah, I loved having him out there with me. That's awesome. So you've experienced one full year of being on the Symmetra tour. Now, this is your second year. Um, so 2019, it was my rookie season. Um, okay. kind of how Q school works. I had partial status. So I played 10 tournaments my first year. There's roughly between like 20 and 22 events. So I did a half season that I had earned full status for 2020, but that was a COVID year. So we were, like we played our first tournament and then everything was kind of shut down for a while and then picked up later. So I'm not sure exactly how many tournaments that we played on the Symmetra. I think that I played like around five or something. So it was a COVID year, which the points didn't count anyway. So this wow. year, 2021, is my first year of having full status since that carries over from what would have been the 2020 season. How difficult was it uh, having to take that year off when you were you were probably in this groove, getting ready to go? You finished four years of college playing every tournament, yeah. amazing. And you get started and then slam the brakes. It was super interesting. So we played our first tournament in Florida. And it's funny because like we had a, you know, had like our main players meeting since it was the first tournament back. And then um, we were talking about the uh, commissioner was like, oh, yeah, like we're monitoring the whole COVID, you know, situation going on. And it's nothing to be worried about. And, you know, everyone at that point, everyone was kind of doing like you know, like kind of like a fist bump instead of a handshake and that kind of stuff. But it was kind of like at that point, I was like, okay, like the COVID's nothing crazy. And then like a week and a half later, it was like, bam, everything like completely shut down. I was like, I didn't even know if I was going to be able to catch a flight home. Everything was shutting down. So it was, like, that was a crazy time. But ultimately I made it back home and that couple months off were the were a couple of the longest months I will say of my entire life. Mm. Um, so in different parts of the country, like Florida and like Phoenix, golf was still open, but here in California, everything was shut down. So literally, even the driving range and putting green. So I would wake up and I felt like that I had the same, like I did the same thing every day. I would get up, I would do my yoga, like little video workout, then I would go putt over on my putting mat inside, then hit balls into my rocket net outdoors, and then do like a little workout and just watch tons of Netflix, and then like get up and do it again for like a couple months. So it was really interesting. So it was Basically, I didn't know what my game was going to be like because I hadn't seen grass or been been out in so long. Wow. But so then at the end of so let's see, well, beginning of May, that's when golf finally opened here in California again. So I was able to go to my to like my home club, Blackhawk Country Club and some of the public courses around, which also too, given that golf is an outdoor sport as well. There's so many people playing golf now, which is great for growing our game and whatnot for golf, but it's hard, it's hard to get a tee timer, you know, right now, right? But really I was able hard. To, really hard, but really I was, hard. Yeah. But ultimately <laughs> I was able to start practicing outdoors again. And um, I mean, I was only practicing for maybe two weeks. And then I signed up for the Colorado Open, which is in Denver. It's one of the biggest state opens. So that was at the end of May. So I really went in like not with many expectations. I was like, I've hardly been playing golf. This is my first competition back. 
And the Colorado Open, uh, there was like, I believe around 130 girls. And there was a lot of the LPGA girls that were playing since their tour had started up, a lot of Symmetra players, other professionals, college golfers. And I went out and I went out and played great. Um, I think I shot it was so it was three rounds. I shot around par slash under par. I think I was like minus three or four or something for the tournament. And then I finished ninth. Um, which was awesome. I ended up tying Sophia Popov um, at ninth place, and she won the British Open this past year. So there were some really good players out there. So I was stoked to see that, hey, after this really long layoff, um, I'm performing. <laughs> That's great. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> oh, um, why do you think you did so well? Because you talked about, and one of the things that I hear over and over and over again when I'm talking to teachers is, no expectations. You can't have expectations. And yet you were saying you didn't have expectations and you did really well. What do oh, you think your key was? Yeah, no expectations. I really think is key. Just I think when you start putting too much pressure, too much weight on a certain tournament, at least for me personally, I tend to overthink it and get nervous and that doesn't help me perform as well. But when I think back to some of my best rounds that I've ever played, everything is just kind of like autopilot, smooth sailing. It's just another day. And that's how it was out there over in Colorado. So you've mentioned going to Colorado, you've mentioned going to Florida um, and you're on a Symmetra tour, which doesn't have a lot of money and you've, you know, like you finished ninth here and you haven't had a lot of uh, high high results, right? High finishes. Yep. yep. How uh, how do you pay for this? How does this has got to be expensive life on the road for this? Yeah, it's very expensive. If you yeah, don't mind so, me asking. Oh no, no. I <laughs> oh, mean, well, that's like I mean, like a lot of us out there and over on tour are in the same boat. Um, so I'm lucky to have like a couple like small sponsors. So Blackhawk Country Club, I get to practice and play out there. And then like my uncle and I get to, um, like he's helping me visualize, um, is a new sponsor that I picked up this year for my hat. But, um, anyway, so I have some people that are helping me out, but ultimately, ultimately it's, um, it puts some pressure over on your play because, as long as you play well, like make the cut and play solid, at least you can earn back your $500 entry fee, right? And for these beginning stretches of tournaments, so me and my travel mate, Audra, actually drove from the Bay Area. We drove from there to Salt Lake to Denver, and then we went to Texas and then Arkansas. Um, so we cross-country trucked it. So between having the two of us splitting costs um, and driving, it was like a lot cheaper. But um, at least like last year, for example, I played on um, some of the state opens and then I did the Women's All Pro Tour, which is this Metro Tour qualifying tour. And between those, um, I was able to like earn like a little bit of money to at least pay back all of my travel expenses. Wow. I can understand yeah. that pressure. Oh, that sounds tough. All right, yeah. well, we'll, we'll uh, talk more about that. Let's take another break. Again, for the podcast listeners, you're going to get a commercial, but why don't you go over to YouTube? If you want to skip the commercial, go over to YouTube to Golf Smarter TV and watch this interview because right now we're going to go to hole number 12, which was a uh, par four. And I didn't get... I, I got your your drive in slow motion, so we'll see how that looks. But then I didn't get I didn't get uh, the the traveling Correct. from the tee down to your first ball because JJ had dropped the head cover and he asked me to go back to the other hole to go get it. So I missed some of that. But we're gonna yeah. watch some of this uh, hole number twelve, and uh, be back after that.
Okay, so I got slow-mo of Elizabeth's drive off of number 12. She made, she just missed the bunker on the left side of the fairway. And uh, the reason I'm just stepping up from behind is because her caddy, JJ, uh, he dropped the putter head cover, so I went to retrieve it. So here we come with our second shot. This is about, about 128 yards. 128 yards to the green from where she is. She's in the light rough, but she has enough room to hit. And JJ said that she was not having a good front nine. Had a lot of bogeys, but we just witnessed her first period of the back. Her second round so far. woman who went before her was her ball was about three four yards behind from where Elizabeth is now but uh, she came up short so there is it's there's definitely some wind here so Elizabeth's ready to go pin high the green, the right side of the green, it's breaking left, and now it's releasing to the back. Another downhill path. Yeah, mm -hmm. I can't remember the last time I've walked, carried 36 holes. Oh my, well, when was the last time you looped for somebody? Yeah, it's been, yeah, many, many years. Yeah, I would think so. Fun? I you school for a buddy of mine in like 2010. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's probably been... Years. Dude, you're a young man, you gotta be walking more. Huh. 36 is a different story though. I feel really good other than ankles. Oh, I'm sorry. The balls, I like the, the heels of my feet are hurting. Oh. Yeah, right, let's see another birdie over here. Yeah, Good luck. She sees a little bit downhill. JJ is saying she should have just in the inside of the hole. She pulled the flag, so we have no idea where the hole is right now. It's the 12th hole, Marin Country Club, par four. This is the qualifier for the LPGA. U.S. Open being played at the Olympic Club. Oh, two birdies in a row. I am good luck for her. She has not been doing well. But all of a sudden, two birdies in a row. <laughs> well, I guess I can't leave now. So hole number 12, another birdie. Another birdie. <laughs> Congratulations. Thanks. And it was a bigger putt. This was a this bigger putt was. than the one before. This one was about 22 feet downhill. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about what the process that you and JJ went through on that one. Yeah. So I hit a like solid tee shot. So, um, so first of all, for you got close, to the, you got close to the bunker. You yes. So just for the listeners, it. Marin Country Club is a very tight golf course. It's a it's a very demanding golf course to something where like you have to hit it so straight out there. And like generally speaking, I'm like a player too that usually averages about 12 out of 14 fairways. So I am a straight like, you know, driver of the golf ball. And at Marin, I think I did stats for my first round. I think I hit six fairways or seven fairways. Like wow. they're so tight. 
given, I mean, some holes, it's like you just trickle into like the rough and whatnot, which is what happened on that hole. But um, yeah, so tight golf course. But so I had a clear shot. It was like 127. It was in the rough to a middle pin. And this green is one that when you hit into it, it hits and it rolls out a lot. And we had a helping wind. Like it was maybe like a three yard to five yard wind. So we're trying to figure out like, "Mm." because if you don't carry the front part of that green, at least it's, it's going to stick there. And then you have a chip shot or like a 40 yard putt from like the fringe. But then if you fly something by that hole, it's going to rock it off the backside. So it's really something where it's like, oh, man, trying to figure out the right club. And there's a bunker Uh, behind the green. Yeah, there is. Um, Bunkers guarding it. So ultimately, we decided let's hit my full pitching wedge, which I hit about between 115 and like 120 carry. And it was perfect. It hit right on the front part of front part of that green but landed on and I rolled out about 22 feet above it and had a downhill little breaker and just went dead in the center (laughs) and now it's making me nervous because uh, up to that point now this was the second round you did well on the first round Mm -hmm. right tell me about your first round yeah no I shot 70 the first round a couple under par Two yeah. under. Um, I believe I think that I had four birdies or five birdies. I can't remember now exactly, wow. but um, it was solid. And then just a couple bogeys. But yeah, I mean, I put it great that first round. Like I did my stats afterwards, and I had twenty six putts, which for me is really good. I usually average wow. about thirty. Yeah. Wow. So like me and JJ were like, oh yeah, I made just about every five footer that I needed to. Um, in the first Jeez. round, um, yeah, I mean, generally speaking, I hit most of, or I hit like a decent amount of fairways. As I said, over at Marin, it's so tight that, um, like they would just kind of trickle off, but it, like, at least it's still like a clear shot into the green. Right. And then just our game plan was just play solid, consistent golf, just hit the middle of like many greens and just two putt it. And then the holes where we had wedges or like a good number, that's when we were a bit more aggressive and made like our birdies. Awesome. So I re- one of the one of the interviews that I did with a golf course architect years ago that just stood out to me, the, one of the lines that stood out to me was I asked him, what's the difference for designing between a public course, a resort course, and a private course, a country club? And he said, well, with, with uh, resort courses, you want the fairways to be as wide as possible and make it as forgiving as possible. And yeah. with country clubs, to go to the other side, with country clubs, you want it tight. You want it narrow because these people play the same course over and over and over again. So you want to make it a little more difficult for them. So Marin Country Club built in the mid-1960s um, and still holds true to, to uh to that being tight fairways, huh? Very tight course. One of the tightest courses that I've ever played. Really? Really? And yeah. you belong to Blackhawk, or you play at Blackhawk, which is yeah. pretty impressive. That's a that's a great course. It is. Yeah, it's awesome. I've been out there for about seven years now, since my senior oh. year of high yeah. school. Um, I've seen it. I've never played it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. So we have two golf courses, actually, the Lakeside and, and Falls. Um, which is great. You get a good like variety there too. So I'm looking at your stats on the Symmetra tour and, uh, your driving accuracy is at 80%. So you're hitting fairways. Yeah, it's pretty solid. That's pretty solid indeed with 66.05% of greens and regulation and your putting average is, uh, 31 point 31 and a half. Ooh, so, not good. Ooh, not, you don't like that. Huh? <laughs> I don't like that. I no. want that to be 30 or lower. So that's probably well, my biggest area for improvement. <laughs> interesting. Cause it puts you, it ranks you at 93rd, uh, okay. your driving accuracy. You're, you're ranked at 18th, which is very good. Yeah. What do you think is your golf superpower? What is it that, um, you car- that carries you through every round? Wedges without a doubt. Um, like, so for example, the first tournament that we had this year over in Phoenix, um, like the first two rounds, uh, my wedges were dialed. So anything that I had between 65 and a hundred, I literally had four wedges that I got within 18 inches. Wow. Yeah. Which is just about tap and range. 
Um, but even out here for the open qualifier, there were two wedges that I almost jarred. Um, one of them landed like a foot away, my pitch mark, and then it kind of spun. So I probably had like nine feet. And then the other one I didn't see, but uh, there were some people that were up top watching. It landed. My pitch mark was about three feet under it. It rolled above it and then it spun backwards and almost spun back in. Like it just kissed the edge and then ended up like about four feet under it. Wow. Was that, I'm thinking of uh, greens above. So above that was number, see that eight. Number, number eight. Number eight. Okay. Wow. I'm kind of familiar with that course. I've played it a couple times, but uh, not a lot. I'm not a member, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I don't care. Um, all right. So your your superpower, you feel your wedge game, um, but that's where you got a lot of your work in the off season or the the COVID season. You were doing a lot of short game work. A lot of wedges. Yeah, that's key. And is that what you would recommend to us to average to the the weekend hack? Oh. Work on your wedges, your short game, chipping and putting. That's everything, no doubt. Because when you have that day where, you know, things are dialed and going well, if you have, you know, good putting and whatnot, then like you're going to make birdies. But those days that, hey, you're struggling a bit and the ball striking isn't quite as good. If you have a good short game and can save par, or even if you're in like a spot where it's like, Oh, I'm stuck behind this tree. I could hit the hero shot and hit the big swooping low, you know, low slice around the tree instead of trying to do the hero shot and make a double or worse. It's, Hey, let me punch out, take my medicine. And since I have such good wedges, I'm going to hit this thing within 10 feet and give myself a good chance to save far. And how do you get your mental game to the point where you have you're just up there going, I got this shot. I know this shot. When, when does, when does hesitation kind of hurt you? Um, so do you ask this question regarding like wedge play or just like a shot in general? Well, first of all, I apologize for asking two questions at once. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> you know which one to answer. Yeah. <laughs> so in regards to your wedge play, you know, mm -hmm. you, you step up to the ball going, I know I got this. Oh yeah. I'm very confident over my wedges. Mm -hmm. And what it's, are the shots that make you go, eh, you know, that, that kind of make you step back a second time going, Oh, maybe not. Oh, um, that would probably be like my longer irons. Once you get into like the five iron, six iron, those ones can be a little nervy at times. Like for example, a good hole that I think of at Marin would be number 16. It's a par three. It's um, to the middle without wind, it's 175. So you're hitting a shot, depending on the pin placement and like the wind, it's anywhere between a 175 and even like a 195 shot because of that hurting wind. So for me, it's and you're anywhere. going over water, right? Is so you're hitting, water? yeah, so Kinda it's nervy because right? you're hitting over water. There's a huge bunker left. It's a small green and anything right of that green is a huge hazard. So there's really no room for air on that hole. Um, so that's something where when you're stepping up to that, you know, tee shot where, okay, I either have a five iron, a hybrid or a five wood. It's like, wow, if I miss it right, I'm in the water hazard and left it's in a bunker, which isn't great. Cause that's a hard save. Like you're probably going to make bogey. So yeah, it's shots like that where it's like, okay, I try to take like an extra breath and be like, all right, let's just pick a solid target middle of the green and just get it on there. <laughs> oh gosh. So um, the next break we're going to about to take, this is the final hole that I followed you. And this is uh, number 13, mm -hmm. which is the one that's directly behind my house, 12 and 13 are directly behind my house. Mm -hmm. Um and uh well let's take a look at that and uh if you're listening we'll be right back after this
not the worst spot to be. Okay. No. And how do you know her? Um, she actually heard me on a podcast. Get out. No, no joke. <laughs> and it was like Entrepreneur on Fire. Um, she was listening to that, heard my story about golf, and, and she's interested in, she listens to a lot of business podcasts. And she reached out last year for right around this event, but it was COVID time. Right. So we just stayed in touch and, um, you know, through Instagram or whatever, um, back and forth. And then met, met her last week when she came out for her practice round here. And yeah, it's been, we've had some good chemistry on the course. Awesome. Reading awesome. putts perfectly, and it's, we're seeing the same things, which is nice. Yeah. Be tough if we're like every hole she's going, oh, it's a cup out, and I'm going, no, it's, it's cup the it's other way. Edge or, yeah. But no, we're pretty much seeing the same thing. That's great. All right, good luck, buddy. She's in the bunker in the fairway here on number 13 at Marine Country Club. And it's right outside my backyard. So it's about 130 uphill into the wind from the bunker. She hit that one thin and to the left, and that went into the green side bunker. Oh, I guess my luck has run out. Like the 60 or the, you want to take it right at the flag and then it'll just die off a little. It's not going to run, it shouldn't run out too much with the lie, you know. This is a, Liz was struggling in the front. She was at minus two after the first 18 holes, but she struggled in the second round so far and had six bogeys. But uh, these two, last two holes, great putts for a birdie. So this is a scramble for par out of the bunker. chatting going on, but it was 
JJ just told us, he's they're on the same page. So it's working well for her. They see things the same way he liked that. Get there, get there, one more roll, and oh, great save. Wow. Fabulous save. Fabulous save. Oh my God, I was so nervous. <laughs> so we just saw the 13th hole, and that was a really impressive, gutsy, gutty, hole for you that was a great par save <laughs> that was a great because your drive went in the bunker then you're yep. hitting up to the to the uh green but you go to a green side bunker on the left it was literally me and jj talked about it like a foot from being perfect a foot yeah. more right and further and i would have rolled up like 10 feet but yeah yeah it was in the oh if not closer because you would have hit that slope and it would have just gone it would have been really the, good the flag was kind of the back right um, so you just missed that shot from the bunker, but then I loved watching you dissect exactly what you had to do out of that greenside bunker. Can you talk about that? Yeah, no doubt. So we were looking, so I was on a bit of an upslope, um, and it's fluffy sand. So this is one that you can really kind of be more aggressive on and try to fly it further closer to that pin. Cause it's going to spin more. So we walk up to the green, you know, we look at it. I'm like, okay, it's a back right pin. It was about a 20 yard bunker shot or so, 25. And I was like, okay, I can pretty much fly it most of the way there. Um, and then I used my sand wedge since it was an upslope and um, balls above my feet, fluffy sand. And I just kind of popped it out of there. And I was trying to leave it I mean, under it, so I would have an uphill putt, but it's fine. It was still a good shot from there. I was 10 feet about above it, um, which is a pretty good shot from there. And then, I mean, that was a, a slippery putt. Green. Oh, yeah, yeah fast really green. fast screen. That was a slippery putt I had coming down 10 feet. I just kind of picked my line, got it rolling, and then just went dead in. <laughs> No, oh, that was great. Uh, I honestly was feeling really guilty because at that point I had to go back to work and I was like, but I just saw you, you had two birdies and a great par save. And I know that the first 10 holes, of uh, the second round, you were struggling, right? Yeah, I was, I wasn't putting well. I missed a lot of short putts and oh. I went at Marin as I talked about it being a demanding golf course off of the tee. I just had a couple little blocks, right, that one went into the hazard and led to a bogey, and then the other one was trees. Um, mm. Yeah, so that's where I was like, okay, like I need it to get something going. So that was like a nice little run there. <laughs> <laughs> and and in the last video we just saw, I, I was able to have a conversation with JJ. You haven't seen any of these videos yet, but I had this conversation with JJ about why you guys connect and how he was so happy that he felt like you guys were on the same page. You saw things the same way. Yeah. And it made it made it so much easier for him for you for you guys to work together. Yeah, definitely. Great. Tell me what's in your bag. Let let's I'm curious uh what clubs you carry. Yeah. So starting at wedges. So Cleveland Strixon is one of my club sponsors. So I play Cleveland wedges, the Zipcore wedges brand new this year. I love them. Um, they have the KBS C taper, 110 gram stiff shafts in them, which is same as my irons, which are the Strixon Z875s. Um, I love Japanese clubs. They feel amazing. They're super accurate. Um, they make great irons and wedges. I would re recommend them to anyone. 
Um, so the, so then I have that through my five iron and then I have my four hybrid, which is my favorite club in my bag. It's also my oldest club. I bought it my freshman year of high school. So I've had it for 10 years now. Um, <laughs> and usually like technology is one of those things where it's like, you want to like get like the newest stuff, but I love that club. I hit it so good. I literally had an ACE this past summer in one of my tournaments in Paris, Texas, Hold out par three, 185 yards. Um, I hold out with it um, this past winter when I was down in Phoenix playing. Um, and it's often a club. It's literally my favorite club. <laughs> that I've is tried awesome. New stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so then it's the tailor made rocket balls um, or hybrid. So that's my favorite. Is, how much, how much of that is in your head or it just, um, it just performs. I, mean, I definitely do love it, but even like whenever I take it into a place where they have a track man or a launch monitor, I hit it really good. Given I maybe hit it a little bit high and spinny, but um, I mean, I hit it so good, right? I hit it so straight and it's just such a comfort thing for me whenever I'm hitting that club. I would rather honestly hit my four hybrid than hit a five iron or, or even six iron. I'd rather have that hybrid. Yeah. There are clubs yeah. in the bag sometimes that just say, just, Go with what you feel. Just, just what other, hit me. What other yeah. shots? What other shots do you do with that hybrid? I mean, like if you're on the, say you're on the. Uh, I have a friend who uses hybrid when he's off the green on the fringe, and he'll use that to get the ball just a little bit in the air and then get it rolling. Um, I'll use a toe up eight iron stuff. But what other uses do you have for your hybrid that is like I need to pull this out now? Um, yeah. So some players have that hybrid shot around the greens in their bag. I more so just like to use my chipping and wedges. Um, mm -hmm. but with the hybrid, I hit it high. So that's good. If I'm ever in a spot where it's like, Hey, I need to hit, you know, I'm pretty far back. I need to hit it over these trees. But since, but since I do hit it high and spinny, I'm able to curve it more. So if I need mm -hmm. to hit a big slice or a big snap hook, I'm able to do it with that club. Interesting. And then what are the, did we finish your bag? We didn't finish your bag. Yeah. So then I have the slider tailor made five wood, which is also pretty old. That club is maybe five years old now, but I like it. Um, and then I have the M5 three wood from tailor made, which is from a couple of years ago. And then I have the Maverick Callaway driver, which is from last year. Excellent. And how much of this do you have to pay for yourself? Um, let's see. Well, the hybrid is ancient along, right. <laughs> along with the five wood. Mm -hmm. Um, the driver I was gifted from Callaway and then right. same thing with my three wood and then, yeah. And then Cleveland, Cleveland and Strixon sponsor me for my irons. So well, that's great. That's yeah. great. So there are ways of saving money on, on the road There are um, <laughs> that, that are critical, obviously, because yeah. you're moving around a lot. Oh yeah. And then putter is the tailor-made spider. I forgot to mention the putter. Okay. Um, yeah. So that one I actually did buy. I bought that this past winter, December. I'd used the Scotty Cameron Fastback for years, like six years. I'm someone that honestly doesn't really change clubs too much. If I like something, I just like it and like I stick to it. But it was yeah. something where on the short putts, I just love the alignment features that the spider had. And I've enjoyed having that in my golf bag. Awesome. Um, you, you talked earlier about liking business and golf podcasts. So mm -hmm. what kind of interest, what did you, would you study at San Jose state beyond golf? I was a business marketing major. <laughs> yeah. So what's your interest? Uh, if you know, when you've, you've decided that the golf, you know, is going to be fun from now on and you're not going to pursue a professional career, which hopefully is many, many years down the road because we want to follow you forever. Um, but so what, what's the interest to, uh, what would you like to do after golf? Yeah, I mean, definitely business and marketing has always been something that I've been interested in. Ever since I've been young, like I've always been pretty into art and pretty like creative. And um, I like to take photos and that kind of thing and just present really good kind of pamphlet. You know, like if you're creating like a business model and want to create like a, pamphlet or like a brochure to sell something to someone. I've always been really good at kind of like 
designing that and like whatnot. So it's something where, I mean, that's where talking to JJ too, right? He's someone that's in business. He's an entrepreneur and like a golfer. I'm like, oh, this is such a great person for me to talk to and have, you know, mentor me and as a friend and like whatnot. But yeah, definitely like down like the line, I can see myself like, you know, for one of these companies, Strixon, TaylorMade, I could be in like, a, you know, in like their marketing department and just somehow like I still want to always be connected in, in golf. But if for whatever reason, my playing career wouldn't work out, I would definitely be like in like the business side and still doing something with it. Well, I got to imagine um, life on the road can get lonely. So mm -hmm. You must be really grateful for podcasts. You must listen oh, to yeah. a lot of I them. Do. As I am grateful that you checked us out. Yeah. <laughs> that you randomly found us. Um, and I wish you nothing but all the luck in the world. I, like I said, I, I know I'm going to be rooting for you. I was a little obvious on the on the uh, video that we shot. That I was like, when you sunk the putters, I was like, I'm so excited for you. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and and I apologize for leaving. I you know because it felt like a little pressure on me. Is like oh well, shoot, she just birdied two holes and had a sand <laughs> save, and I'm good luck, and now I'm leaving. Uh oh. It's fine. I like totally get it. Thank you for coming <laughs> out over on those three holes. <laughs> oh well, I, I I really enjoyed watching it. I didn't think I generally don't like being at live golf events because something's always happening somewhere else. And, yeah. and somebody who has an attention issue, you know, knowing that things are going on somewhere else drives me nuts. But the oh, fact I that it. I was able to just focus on you and be your gallery was <laughs> uh, just, it was just a treat. I really enjoyed it. Thank and you so I, much, I look forward. I look forward to following you beyond the Symmetra Tour and watching you play in the U.S. Open someday at the LPGA U.S. Open. I it's have. not going to be this year, but you're going to yeah. make it. You're gonna do I it. will. I have actually. I played in it in 2013. What? The U.S. O the LPGA U.S. Open when you were in 2013? Yeah. How did? Wait. How did that happen? What did I miss here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was uh, 16 when I when I qualified and played in it. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, As all right. Well, we're gonna take we're gonna take another time out, and then we're gonna find out more about that. Hang on, no video here. So all this time you're telling me about getting, you know, through the Symmetra tour, trying to make it, you know, going through college and stuff. And mm -hmm. wait, and you've played in the U.S. Open? I did when I was 16. How did yes. you How did you qualify for that? And let's start with the qualif the qualifying. Yeah, so I qualified over at Lake Merced Golf Club over in Daly City, which now hosts mm -hmm. the LPGA event. Um, it was my first time playing 36 holes ever. I didn't know what to expect. Um, it's funny because Dan, who was you know my family friend, golf coach, he wanted me to sign up for for this qualifier, and I literally remember having a argument with him. I was like, Dan, I was like, I'm not gonna sign up. I was like, there's no chance of me qualifying. I was like, it's it's like a waste of time. I have to miss school like a whole day Monday. Yeah, like the whole day Monday. It's a waste of money. Like I was like, why? I was like, I'm not gonna make it. I was like, how come? And then he's like, come on, just do it. So eventually I was like, okay, fine. I'll just sign up. So I did my practice round that Sunday before, like barely saw like the golf course. It was getting dark on 18, but I got my practice round in. And back to that thing that we talked about earlier about having no expectations. I literally had none. I went out there and just played my game. I was 16 um, and shot 73, 74, a couple solid rounds out there at Lake Merced. And next thing I know, I qualified. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so you had to be in what, top two to, to qualify? There were three spots. Three spots. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And it was crazy. So I was at now, this qualifier yeah. with all these other professional women, LPGA players, Metro players, college players. I was in high school. I was 16. And back to what we talked about earlier, too, it's I picked up a club for the very first time at age 13. So I'd only been playing for three years. <laughs> so I didn't really know, like, you know, what I was doing. <laughs> but, oh, um, yeah, I went out and qualified. <laughs> 
Okay. And then where was the U.S. Open that year? It was at Sebanat Golf Club over in Long Island, New York. So it's neighboring Shinnecock Hills. Okay. Beautiful and, course. And let's go over your first round. Yeah. <laughs> so at the U.S. Open first round, I shot 78. Um, not bad considering I took an eight over on a hole out there. So like basically I go into the U S open and, and I don't have a bunker game. Right. And like, I love Dan, he was a great coach, but when I was a junior golfer, I didn't know any better. Whenever I would end up in a like greenside bunker during practice, he would just tell me to pick it up and pull it out and just go putt or go chip and not practice the bunker shot. And I was like, okay. I didn't know. So next thing you know, you're playing in the U S open with these massive bunkers at seven at golf club. <laughs> so I took an eight on this hole. I was like, Oh God. Um, but you know, I still kept fighting that round. And so next thing you know, we get to the 16th hole. Um, it's par four uphill. Um, I hit good drive in the middle and then I have around 200 yards. So I have a five wood coming in. So me and my caddy are talking like, okay, like let's just take it, you know, a little bit left of this pin middle of the green with a five wood. And I end up pushing it like right at it. And I was like, Oh, like it looks pretty good. And it's up there and, um, hits on the green and there's a huge grandstand next to this green, all these fans watching. Um, and hits on the green, everyone's silent. So I'm like, okay, it must have go, it must have gone long or something. So it hits on the back part of the screen. There's a slope, rolls all like the way back into the front, ends up jarring it. I make eagle. The crowd goes nuts. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, I just eagled. And then they caught like my reaction too, because there was a guy taking photos out there <laughs> of all the players. So yeah, I had yep, I had an eagle in the U.S. Open amazing all right that was your first <laughs> wow see but you still yeah. shot a 78 because of that eight and and yeah. i want to i can can i find the pictures of that yeah you can um, you can uh, of that is it on youtube of the um Eagle? so the, so they don't have a video but they do have a photo of my reaction which should be online if not i i do have it and then can send it to you oh please do Oh, please. I, I want that photo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That was your first round. So now you're, you're, you've got to really fight for your second round here, right? Or is it with three rounds? Um, so it's two rounds cut and then two rounds. Okay. So, I mean, I'm feeling overall pretty good. I mean, I shot a 78. Michelle Wee shot 80 that first round. So I was like, all right, I beat Michelle Wee. That was cool at least. Um, and um, I mean, just being out there, like, I mean, I was so nervous. I was so young, you know, um, basically I think that the cut, I can't remember exactly. I'm sure that like you could find it, but it was something where probably cause it's the U S open a couple of rounds is 74, 72 kind of right in there. Um, yeah. So then, you know, I needed like a good second round and unfortunately the second round did not go great for me. I had similar bunker troubles, um, to the first round, except, except on a couple holes, but just the whole experience was incredible being out there, signing autographs, like being inside of the ropes playing, like it just set up everything for me where I was like, man, this is what I want to do as my career. I was like, I love this. <laughs> well, it could go either way, right? You have two okay rounds, not great. You didn't make the cut. You could either go, you know what? This is more pressure and, and pain than I need to deal with. Or you go, I'm totally hooked. I can't wait to do this again. Oh, it was incredible. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and so you've been battling it. But you were 16 years old 16. and didn't really know what you were doing. No, I didn't. <laughs> I, I love that story. Right. That's phenomenal. I'm so glad we came back for that. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh my gosh. So what other surprises you're not telling me about? <laughs> I mean, yeah, just it just followed up um after the US Open. I played great that summer in like junior golf. Um I was one of the top players in like Northern California. 
Um, so then like I won the Northern California tournament of champions that summer. So you have to win a tournament to be invited. Um, and then it was at Silverado resort hosted by Johnny Miller. So it was a big honor to just be invited out there. And then I ended up winning that, um, when I got invited to that. And then it was something like that summer. Um, I played, it was like five tournaments where I totaled like 16, 16 under par or something like I had a great summer um and then heading into my senior year um obviously was playing some great golf and then I finished second in the high school state championship here in California so that was a great accomplishment too wow very impressive so I'm curious now you, you, when you started it was a family friend who turned you on to it is your family into golf now um, to be honest, my mom, my mom doesn't know the difference between a par and birdie. <laughs> Still, she wow. kind of watches golf, but now she just doesn't she, really Do they know. come out and watch you play? But then my dad, yes. My dad doesn't play. Like he's someone like if he goes to the driving range and has a bucket of balls, he's going to top th- like about 30 of them type <laughs> of deal. <laughs> like like oh, very yeah. much so beginning. Yeah. Uh, doesn't play, but yeah, it does come out to watch me play tournaments, especially when, you know, I went to college here locally. So we always played in Stanford's tournaments in fall and spring. There was a tournament at Silverado, uh, our, our home tournament as well. So yeah. So then he would definitely come out for those. And then he would come out for Q school as well as a professional. Do you have siblings? Yes, I do have an older brother. An older brother. Okay. Mm-hmm. And is he athletic? He did swimming throughout high school. Um, and that was my background too. Swimming, yeah. water polo, and before water polo. playing golf. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, interesting. But he doesn't play golf. Doesn't play. I'm the only one. <laughs> wow. You don't even challenge him going, come on, come on. I can beat you at something here. Right? Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, right? No, seriously. I'm like the only one. It's funny because yeah. kind of like I was saying, a lot of these girls that play, you know, their whole family plays or like their mom or dad plays or their grandpa or someone got them into it and they start young. So that's where my story is just kind of different. And, you know, because I started when I was 13, it was pretty late relative to most and no one else plays in my family. Well, it's a great story and I really appreciate you sharing with us and being honest about it and, and answering my questions. I yeah. didn't have to edit any of them out. I really cool. do. And again, um, we're rooting for you and want to watch you for a long time. Best of luck. Thank you so much, Fred. Appreciate it.